What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Grid Live Encore. I'm Ben Schneider, joined, as always, by Brandon Crossland. Brandon, how's it going? Going all right, Ben. Good to see you and everyone here on Grid Live Encore. We had our weekend at the parking lot, and I think it went better than I was bracing for impact. I think it went pretty well. And surprisingly, just uh, having positive feelings after this weekend, which I did not expect at all. Yeah, I got to say, I think the, the bar has been set very low in the minds of a lot of fans when it comes to this track. Um, you know, just whether it's the on-track product or stuff that happens on social media, off the track even. I know the, the pace car uh, celebrity selected for this week certainly raised a couple of eyebrows as well with uh, <laughs> still being there. But hey, in terms of the actual racing product, I think, uh, especially coming off of a couple of uh, duds with an X-Gen car on a short track, I think it could have been worse. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that here. I don't want memories of the fall 22 race to, to come flooding back here. But um, for, for NASCAR race weekend in Texas, I think there was certainly uh, some good action. And we'll ha- we have to start with that in the Xfinity race. We'll get into that here uh, in just a moment. But before we do that, as always, want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters, Colin DeShell, Mark, Robin, David, and Matthew. Thank you so much for your support. And if you like what you see tonight, you can feel free to join them through the link in the description box below, or if you'd rather make a one-time donation instead, you can visit the Buy Me a Coffee link. You can buy a coffee for a specific member of our team here at Grid Network. Any amount helps us continue to grow this member sport media outlet, or if you're watching us live on YouTube, or after the fact as well, we have the Super Chats and Super Thanks, respectively, enabled as well. And the biggest thing that you can do if you don't uh, have the opportunity to support us financially, you can just support us by following us on all of our social media platforms, specifically uh, right here on YouTube, even though we have hit the milestone of 1,000 subscribers, we still appreciate any new support we get on this channel here. So thank you all for continuing to support us on this journey now to 2,000 subscribers. We'll hopefully have the second 1,000 come a little bit faster than the first 1,000 did here. Now, like I said, uh, what else are we going to start with here? We have to talk about the Xfinity Series finish, and we'll get into the heartbreak for Ryan C coming so close, two one thousandths of a second away from finally breaking through and getting that win But let's talk about the winner first. Let's give them credit where it's due. Sam Mayer and Junior Motorsports certainly needed a run like this. Brandon, is this the boost that they've needed after a slow start to the year, really, for the entire organization? Absolutely. A a win can heal a lot of wounds. I think Junior Motorsports is feeling that in the the meeting they had today somewhere in Mooresville. Uh, Sam Mayer said it took every ounce in me to do that. And I I believe it with all the the, the rub there on the – I think it was a, well, on the side of the car anyway for Sam Mayer. Still a young driver and picks up the win there. Now just 153 points behind the cutoff line if it were to end today. Um, got got himself in a really good position here. Or still in the spring time of the season, able to uh, you know, essentially lock himself in. He, he got his win last year at Road America and took care of it later on in the season as well. And, and had a pretty uh, fun playoff run that we got to to keep up with last year. Hoping for the same this year for Sam Mayer. And, and yes, this does a great deal of healing for Junior Motorsports. Uh, we just got to get some of the other drivers there on the same program and and hopefully get some more going there for, for not only them, but the rest of Team Chevy as well. Now, through the first six races, uh, Mayer only had one top 10. He had three DNFs as well and four total finishes of 30th or worse. So, he certainly set himself uh, back quite a bit in the point standings with a lot of work to do. Um, I believe he was uh, perhaps even a little bit lower than Eric Almarola was uh, in the point standings coming into this weekend. And Almarola, of course, is only running a partial schedule, though he does have uh, that win at Martinsville and a second place at Richmond, plus the uh, couple of stages that he's picked up as well. So that's helped him in the points. Obviously, it doesn't matter too much for the playoffs because he's not running for a championship. But uh, for Mayer to come second to Almarola, at Martinsville, and then on the heels of that, to come pick up a win, uh, even if it's by just two thousandths of a second, whatever that is, maybe half an inch uh, at the start finish line, um, still a job well done for that team. Uh, but like you mentioned, the entire organization kind of needs that shot in the arm. Justin Allgaier, you see him up there in third, he had a solid day, uh, looked like he might be in line for the win as well. So, does his strong run coupled with Mayer's win, is that a sign that maybe things are starting to turn around? You even see Sammy Smith up there in the top 10 as well. Maybe things are headed in the right direction for junior motorsports. Yeah, hopefully. Sammy Smith is the other piece of that puzzle. We've got to see some some action there for him. Yeah, Justin Allgaier, that, that was a strong run. But still, it's like sweeping both stages and still not being able to cusp the victory. 
Uh, thankfully, it went to another one of their, you know, their teammates. But I, I keep thinking back to Justin and, and Phoenix this year. I think that just set a really bad taste in their mouth of, of what was to come. They're, they're sweeping it around now. Four top tens for, for all guy right after that, two top fives. And just one DNF to speak of. And that, and that, that was there at Phoenix. So, um, it, but it, it's left a, a deeper impact, I think, than the, the stat sheet will tell for them. Yeah, well, and Sammy Smith as well, he's eighth in the point standings, and he has six finishes between seventh and tenth. So he is very consistent. But, again, when you're driving for Juno Motorsports, of course, the goal is to win races and compete for championships. And, of course, Sammy Smith is still a very young driver. He's got uh, some time to continue to improve and uh, prove his worth here in the Xfinity Series. But you would hope that in the second half of the season, those top tens could turn into top fives. He could maybe pick up a win or two here or there as well and uh, give Juno Motorsports another a uh, bullet to work with here uh, as they try to make the championship four with all four of their full-time drivers. Yeah. And the other piece of that is the nine car, Brandon Jones. I think if I remember correctly, he got the pole at Martinsville. He did. Uh, yeah. And, but he, but that, he had to start in the back and uh, he ended yeah. up getting shuffled back to the end there anyway. Yeah. Not, not, not a great uh, start for Brandon Jones either. Very, like I said before, very forgettable last season whenever he made the switch over to junior motorsports. Um, sitting with two DNFs this year and a total of three laps led three top tens for the nine car. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, I, I keep hearing some chatter, you know, Alex Bowman had uh, an issue in the cup series race yesterday and uh, people talking about him, you know, kind of being the weak link over at Hendrick right now in the cup series. Although to be fair, he does have two champions and a guy that's racking off wins left and right and William Byron to deal with. So, um, you know, for, for the weak link to still be, uh, at the back end of a top 10 in points, I think Hendrick is uh, firing on all cylinders right now. But um, my main thing with people that you know don't know that Bowman necessarily deserves that seat is like, show me show me who at Junior Motorsports, which would be the most logical pipeline, is ready to take that 48 car. Because because think about it. I don't think Justin Allgaier wants that at this stage in his career. I think he's happy to, I mean, I don't think he would do a bad job in that car, but I think he's more content at this point to just keep going with the Xfinity program he's been a part of for the better part of a decade now. Um, Sammy Smith, I don't think is ready. Sam Mayer, I, I think could probably use a, a couple more years as well. Um, you know, so I, so I look at this, I look at this organization and of course, Brandon Jones, like you were mentioning, uh, Brandon, I, I don't know that you put him in the 48 car. You necessarily uh, can expect to see better results there as well. And, and even wow. if you do grant that, you know, Sammy Smith has a lot of potential, um, you know, Sam Mayer has a lot of potential. Think of what William Byron was doing his first couple of years in that 24 car. You know, it takes some time for these guys to make that adjustment. You know, Ty Gibbs, he, he set the Xfinity world on fire. He still hasn't won a cup race. He's come close. I think that win's coming this year. But, you know, I just, I, I don't know that any of those guys, you know, you can definitively say like, you know, RCR, for example. I think personally, if you put Austin Hill in the three car over what Austin Dillon's doing right now, you could maybe have an argument there. I don't see anybody at Junior Motorsports that fits that bill for you know getting in the 48 at Hendrick at the moment but that being said you know it, it does look like things are trending in the right direction and hopefully they can continue to build on these results uh, as we get into the heart of the season here and into the second half yeah it just shows you how different the Xfinity car is from the cup car um you know you, you look at the case of Ty Gibbs just flying out the gate there in Xfinity and then still we're, we're we, we think of him as one of the ones is going to get it like next week next week next week it's still not there yet. Talladega could be it, but it's yet to be seen. Sam Mayer, I think if someone's going to take the 48 next, Sam Mayer might, is the one I'm zeroing in on. Because, you know, you said Justin Allgaier, he's, he's fine being there on Saturdays. Sam seems to be really coming into his own. And I know he's. it's been a lot of just hard luck and also just painful getting through the beginning of this season before this win at Texas Motor Speedway. But I look at last year and see the the wins of the road courses, Road America, Watkins Glen, Charlotte, and then he got one at Homestead, the the bread and butter of all mile and a half, so what we enjoy the most going down there to Miami. He's got some very impressive places on his resume. And like Texas or not, that's a slippery, dangerous place. And to get it down there at a photo finish, he that that takes some talent. He's he's definitely someone you don't want to have a passing glance of. You want to uh, keep an eye on him. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, again, to your point about the next gen car being so different, um, you know, I think some people brought this up uh, this weekend as well. Jimmy Johnson 
uh, back with Legacy Motor Club. Of course, he's not a Hendrick or uh, even a Chevy driver anymore. That team has switched over to Toyota. But I think some people were saying, you know, look, Jimmy, if you if you still got the itch to scratch and uh, want to come back and race in NASCAR, maybe the Xfinity Series might be a better place at this point in in your career, just because the next gen car is so radically different. And uh, he's you know certainly well behind everybody else who's on their third full time year with that car now. Um, you know, maybe the Xfinity car resembles more of what he's used to uh, from his Cup career, and that might be a better place for him to make these uh, not one-off starts because he's making a handful of them, but, um, you know, good, like Dale Earnhardt Jr. every year, be a good opportunity for him to get in the car a couple of times and uh, continue to do this. Yeah, I hate that for him, and that might be a good a good solution for him. But I did see from uh, Mr. Brandon Ponetto, he's, of course, a Blue Jimmy 48 sure. fan, you yep. know, follows Jimmy to the core. Uh, he said P29 in Texas. The finish may not reflect it. This is quoting him. But the fact we finished on the lead lap is a W, and I, and I agree with that. Finishing on the lead lap for Jimmy at Texas, you know, especially with uh, all the events that happened personally last year, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I was wanting to bring that up at some point in the show. Uh, yeah. That tw- that P29, it's, it's hard to believe that Jimmy Johnson finishing 29th is a win. If you tell me that in 2016, I'm, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, yeah. Seven-time champion as we're going to Thanksgiving, but – uh, yeah, that, that's a win for him. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, again, you know, I, I understand, you know, some, some people are even you know, questioning, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you here? I think, you know, he, Jimmy Johnson gets into a car. His goal is to win, you know, driver number 84 wants win number 84 in the cup series. Right. You know, I think that, uh, you know, it, 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 he's probably got a better chance of doing it a, a track like Dover where he's, uh, he's dominated and won so many times. Although now that I think about it, he won quite a bit of Texas as well. It, granted it was, uh, mostly the old configuration, but, um, you know, I think that, again, I think the, the Xfinity car, certainly it, it's it's not a direct comparison to the Gen 6 or, or even the Gen 5, but I think there's, there's certainly much more overlap there uh, than what you're going to get with the next gen car. And uh, again, just echoing the people that think, you know, that might be a good solution for him. Uh, we'll see how it starts this year ago. But again, you know, I, I know Brandon's far from the only one there, you know, a lot of people pulling for him as he uh, has, has returned from a couple of years in IndyCar trying to, you know, rediscover that magic again. I'm trying to think where he would be able to go. I guess uh, Sam Hunt racing would be uh, an opportunity maybe or potential. Yeah. Yeah. So well, like again, that, cause like not, not Joe Gibbs, but maybe, maybe, but the 20 all-star car, I don't see him going there yeah. if, he, if he did do it. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's all like, if I feel like if anybody can get around the, manufacturer restrictions it's probably it's a probably guy like jimmy johnson yeah, yeah. so I, I don't know that he might be held as tightly to those as, as somebody else might but then again it it is a different world than it was uh 15 20 years ago when that was a little bit more commonplace so yeah That's sam hunt true. racing i think would, would probably be the more logical solution for him but you know who knows what could happen well let's uh go to the other side of uh this photo finish here and again uh, absolutely heartbreaking. I think even Sam Mayer was saying this was the last guy that I wanted to pass uh, mm-hmm. in that situation for a photo finish like that. And I saw some fans on Twitter saying, you know, shame on on Sam Mayer. He, he's won some of these before. He should have no. uh, let Ryan celebrate his first <laughs> win. And I think that that's just got to be the most absurd thing I that's, saw yeah. all week as if that's in any race car driver's DNA. Um, you know, Denny Hamlin beating Matt DiBenedetto in that uh, Levine uh, family race – family racing car at uh, Bristol all those years ago, I think is another example of that. He was, he was very apologetic to his uh, Toyota teammate and uh, hated that he was the guy that he had to pass, but you're, you're not going to tell a race car driver to let somebody else win. I think that's just absolutely yeah. absurd. But uh, regardless, I think even Dale Jr. sent a tweet out saying that, you know, part of him was, was pulling for Ryan Siegler at the end. How heartbreaking is this for uh, that driver that has been through so much with his family team? And what does he have to do to finally break through and win one of these things one day? I don't know, man, but he was he was bad fast though for for Texas, a, a place like that. We don't expect the the mid tier teams to to shine. It, it's usually places where they they've got the the uh, the restrictor plate working in their favor, or um, um, places like that where it's where it's a little less on, on the power side uh, to make your way to the front, or when it's more of a more of on an equal footing. Man, Ryan Sieg and him him and Kyle both. Um, that that's a cool thing that they've, they've been around uh, over the years there in the Xfinity series, that, that uh, organization there. And it is very heartbreaking to see Ryan C just come 
so short there at the line. Definitely had the power to do it though, and impressed me a lot there. Even the like, you think he took the lead like 19 laps to go, and it, it was already kind of a shock then. You th well, you th it was they had a photo finish at the line then, and he designed and then he was able to clear uh, Sam Mayer there. But if you thought it was impressive then, just wait <laughs> towards the end, and what and what we got was was very cool. So I was at a track meet all day on Saturday. Uh, we, were, we went down to Connecticut. So we had to, the bus left uh, the college at six o'clock and I didn't get back in until uh, around eight. So I was gone for, it was a 14 hour day for me. So I was trying to monitor uh, X slash Twitter on my phone and uh, couldn't watch the race live, obviously, because I was at a track meet, but um, just seeing the reactions from people, I think everybody uh, one, once again, just to drive home the point was, was really gutted for Ryan Sieg to, to finish, not just second again, but to, finish second by about as close of a margin as you can possibly get there. I think this is the second closest uh, finish in the history of this series behind uh, Tyler Reddick and Elliott Sadler Daytona in 2018, I think. So, uh, yeah, I mean, again, and, and a track like Texas too, you know, you, yeah. you might expect it, you know, at Daytona or Talladega or, or Super Speedway, but uh, to, to get it here um, at Texas, I mean, it certainly gave the fans one heck of a show. And I think to your point, uh, as you opened the show, Brandon, uh, you know, really, I don't know if it was necessarily the greatest Xfinity race at Texas of all time overall, but certainly an all-time classic finish. And uh, I think, again, you know, if, if first and second had been reversed, we'd probably be singing its praises a little bit more uh, than we are already. Again, not to take anything away from uh, Sam Mayer, but he has won uh, in this series before and is driving a car that I think most people would consider a little bit better equipment than what Ryan Sieg has. But um, again, you know, just so close to that, that upset win and that feel-good story. But uh, if nothing else, I'm sure that this is going to just light a fire underneath Ryan Sieg even more uh, to go out there. And uh, maybe this weekend at Talladega, he's run very strong there uh, and, and at Daytona in the past. So it might be a good opportunity for him to go one better and finally break through. Yeah. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't feel bad that Sam Mayer took it. Like, it's driver mentality. You're going to do it. And I, Sam Mayer needed this win, too. I can remember, like, just a few days ago when Michael Annette was in the one car and, and how that performed. He was able to, you know, get some success uh, at, I think it was Talladega or something. Just like, but other than that, it was like. season opener at Daytona. Daytona. The, right, right, right. Yeah. Car. Yeah. Yeah. But anything other than that, it was like, yeah, that's that's the dud of the team. There they are. You know, the, the one car was kind of the, the joke, and Sam Mayer has turned that around for sure. All right. Well, let's stick with the Xfinity series here and uh, let's roll into our first open segment of the night. We're going to do a couple of these because we only have the Texas races uh, to recap here. Uh, we got some news regarding uh, the television coverage. Uh, the CW is going to be coming in a little bit earlier than we were expecting. NBC has transferred uh, their last eight Xfinity races this year over to the CW, but it's going to be kind of a hybrid of the two networks working together as we understand it. Uh, the booth will be Rick Allen, Jeff Burton, Steve Letarte, like is commonplace for uh, NASCAR and NBC. And uh, you'll still see NBC's production crew behind these broadcasts, but it's going to allow the CW to sort of get their feet wet, so to speak, before they go in full time in 2025. So, Brandon, what's your reaction to this news? Maybe kind of a throwback to NBC and TNT's partnership uh, about 20 years ago during their first stint in NASCAR. Yeah, it'll be nice to get that little flavor of the CW, at least on their network to see what they're doing. And also, I guess, to go ahead and get our CW logins <laughs> set up, you know, and, you know, connect it with your TV provider or what have you. But um, I, I am glad that that we, we at least get the NBC booth and the whole production uh, working to the end of the season as scheduled. I'm glad they're not throwing that on the CW crew and, you know, completely new booth and new production crew that's going to be taking over in 25. Um, and I, I don't, I, I'd like to know the reasoning behind why they had to come in after everything was set up and go actually last eight races we need, we need to put it on CW. But I, but I imagine, um, but that curiosity aside, I imagine it'll feel a lot like uh, NASCAR on, on USA. Cause you know, it, it's, it's, it's basically seamless. The, the difference between, NASCAR on NBC and NASCAR on USA sometimes. I mean, the only difference really is just what's there on the ticker and what Rick Allen says, it's NASCAR on USA yeah. or NASCAR on NBC. You know, it's it's the same thing. They just change who they're talking to. And I think that's what we're going to see here in the last eight races. But I think you also talked about uh, 
times being moved back as well. Yeah, they tweaked the start times a little bit. I got to confess, I didn't have the schedule memorized, but I, I did hear that that was another talking point that uh, it's, the start times were tweaked, which I guess makes sense, you know, for a network uh, and a deal that's kind of coming together here uh, at the last minute. But, um, you know, I, I think that, again, you know, to your point, Brandon, it's, it's, it's a good deal for the Xfinity series going forward because, again, you know, people might not realize this, but the CW technically network television, and I think uh, after the big four, um, perhaps it's the fifth largest uh, network TV station in, in the country. So, um, you know, again, you know, it's it's not something that might be at the top of fans' minds in terms of a channel that they usually tune into. But most people who uh, have access to television should be able to find it one way or another and uh, be able to watch Xfinity races next year and the race to get into the playoffs. And then, of course, all seven playoff races being on uh, the CW as well. But I want to ask your thoughts on this because I've heard a couple of people uh, th- float this theory out here. We believe we're getting Lee Diffie uh, back in NASCAR uh, for some broadcasts later this year. It seemed like Rick Allen was uh, kind of transitioning out of the NBC booth, and uh, he's going to be calling these CW races. Do you think he might be the one that they've selected for their Xfinity broadcast in 2025? Would that theory make sense to you? That would be really interesting because I remember Lee Diffie with the Watkins Glen Cup race. I, I'm not sure... My, my memory is foggy of what else he did, but I, I remember Watkins Glen being very memorable uh, with Lee Diffie on the call. And of course, with being a road course in so many turns, it's a little more uh, down his alley, I guess. Although he's he, he's he's such a seasoned guy. He can do all sorts of things. Uh, motocross, so, you know, all the Olympic sports that he helps cover there with NBC. But um, he, he's got he's got a special flair to him that is going to be really appreciated and um, that that yeah that doesn't bother me at all having Lee Diffie uh, on the NBC broadcast. I think if anything, he he only brings the 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 same level of experience as Rick Allen, if not some 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 different things that that will help them along. Um, but Rick Allen going to the CW that'd be interesting if he's trying to either they're forcing him to phase out to go there or he is trying to phase out and, and go to the CW. Um, yeah, it, that that's. That's a, a mixed bag of, of possibilities there. Yeah, so it was actually, it was because Rick Allen was uh, in London doing the track and field world championships that Lee Diffie stepped in for Watkins Glen in Michigan. If you remember uh, Kyle Larson taking the lead on that restart from uh, Truex and Eric Jones, who were Furniture Road teammates at the time. Um, those were two cup races that he did in 2017. So he, and he also did the, uh, the hot pass coverage every year uh, from, I think, 2015 to 2019 on NBCSN uh, it was kind of a covered uh, broadcast that focused on the championship four drivers. And um, I think in 2017, they, they had uh Dale and Hart jr. Had a, an onboard camera as well, because it was his last race. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's called cup races for NBC before and uh, some extended ones as well. It's not going to be a completely new uh, sort of deal for him. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to that. I've always loved uh, when Lee's on the call for anything, like you mentioned, Brandon, he, he's, of course, does track and field at the Olympics and uh, some other events as well. And uh, again, I think that that's going to go really well. And hopefully for uh, for Rick Allen and uh, the CW, I think that you know this could be maybe potentially a preview of what we're going to see in 2025. Of course, still a lot of pieces to fall into uh, place here for this puzzle that we're building for next season when everything transitions over. But um, it's going to be an interesting conversation point later in the year, that's for sure. Yeah, it'll be cool to to bring the action to some Xfinity Series races. Uh, thanks to Lee Diffie, that's um, one of those phrases that will go down in motorsports history. I'm sure of of famous famous calls. Time time to bring the action. I still remember when uh F, the F1 season was starting. Tucker White tweeted uh as Ed Lee Diffie would say, yes. "It's time to bring the action." And Lee saw that mm-hmm. and quoted it and said, "Except there was hardly any action made because, of course, Verstappen just." Uh, cakewalk to another win. Yeah, uh, I love the honesty too of, of Lee, and he he will he's replied to me several times, which which shows you he'll reply to anybody. Um, I yeah, like how involved here. he is. Yeah, I like how involved he is on X, and um, I, I I feel the the humbleness there, and also the the you know very very friendly nature of Lee. He's very very nice guy to to see in his professional career. Yeah, I have the opportunity to. Uh, go to Sellersville Theater uh, a couple of years ago. He did a reunion show with uh, Steve Match and David Hobbs, and uh, they recapped the 2022 F1 season. And uh, 
great, great to see those guys in person. And uh, you could tell that their, their chemistry, despite the fact that they hadn't been on the air together for a few years, uh, was still very much intact and uh, always appreciate his insights on the sport as well. So looking forward to having him back in the NASCAR booth uh, later this year. And uh, again, you know, we'll, we'll see how this goes, but uh, again, uh, piece of news that broke this week, uh, the last eight races for the extending series this year on the CW. So make sure you uh, set a reminder for yourself as we get into uh, the playoffs for the Xfinity Series this year. That partnership starting a little bit earlier uh, than we were anticipating here uh, at the end of 2024. We move on now to the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series. An absolute all-time shocker. Kyle Busch has won a Truck Series race. Brandon, what are your thoughts on that in reaction to this incredible upset victory? Oh, I can't believe it, Ben. Are you telling me that Kyle Busch came down to the truck series and took the checkered flag? I, Who'd have thought? Ne I've never heard this story before, especially at Texas Motor Speedway. Never yeah. heard it. Never heard of it. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm absolutely speechless. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I never would have expected Kyle Busch in this situation to, to come into a series like the, the Crafts and Truck Series. I mean, it's, it's not like he'd won 65 of these races before. Um, and, and come in here in, in, a, in a truck that's not even his. It's a Spire Motorsports truck. He used to do this for his own equipment, but this is a completely different situation here. It's not like Spire purchased uh, KPM in the offseason either. Um, and, and, he, and he held off uh, some of the finest talent in the truck series to, to get the W. I mean, it's, it's truly yeah. a, an incredible. I mean, this is the story of the year. I don't think anything's going to top this. No, unless when he does it again, you know, with his final starts. Uh, it says in all caps, <laughs> Kyle Busch shocks the world. And he did it there at that Andretti Global, I mean, um, Spire Motorsports <laughs> truck. So very cool. And also with Realtree, no doubt. Yeah. Well, in, in all seriousness here, um, something that came up from this that uh, was surprising to me, given how long they've been in the sport, uh, it was Realtree was on his truck this weekend. And uh, this is their first time in Victory Lane as a sponsor, which, uh, you know, we, we had the Hooters drought ended. This weekend as well with Chase Elliott and McDonald's Trout ended not so long ago with Bubba Wallace getting his win at Talladega. So, um, Brandon, do you have any do you have any thoughts on that? I was quite surprised given I I would have thought for sure Realtree was on a, an RCR car or, or one of them that had gone to victory lane, but this was their first time. Yeah, that that's really cool. And that that reminds me of the McDonald's Trout, reminds me of uh, some other sponsors that never made it to victory lane. I, th I think Kmart may have been one of those. Yeah, I might I might be wrong. We we need Brock Beard here to confirm that. But I'm also going through real tree uh, appearances over the years, and you know, of course, Kevin Harvick and uh, Tyler Reddick when he when he was with RCR, Austin Hill, Austin Dillon, Dave Marcus back in the day. Um, down and down it goes. I mean, it's been all over the place, but never actually got a victory with him. I mean, it had been an, uh, an associate sponsor with like Kevin Harvick and um, I mean, also Dale Earnhardt. Um, but yeah, first time actually as a primary sponsor getting the win. Um, that's pretty cool. Also on the same weekend that, you know, you get another one with Hooters. So, yeah. Well, that photo of uh, Kevin Harvick with uh, Clint Boyer, Talladega, I think uh, that was 2010 uh, where Boyer edged him out uh, when they were teammates at RCR at the time. I guess that was a close call for them, but uh, you know, again, like you mentioned, just listing all those names off there, um, you would have thought that they would have gotten a win at some point uh, along mm -hmm. the way there. But uh, this was their first time and a uh, pretty cool paint scheme. I don't know, but I'm going to be picking up the die cast myself if they offer it, because I, I mean, goodness knows I have enough uh, race win trucks of, of Kyle Busch alone with how often he's done this. But, um, you know, cool story there at the very least. And I, and I have to say as well, um, credit to Corey Heim. Credit to uh, Christian Eckes, who had another strong run again. I think that that McAnally Hilgeman team is firing on all cylinders, no doubt. Um, one of the feel good stories of the year there uh, with that entire effort. But d despite what the statistics show with how many laps he led, it was not like he cakewalked his way to a, a 10 second win here. It was kind of interesting, kind of interesting in the closing laps uh, as, as he had some of those young guys uh, chasing him down and trying to find a way around him to get the win unfortunately uh for them they came up short fortunately for kyle bush unfortunately for those that don't like the cup regulars in uh the lower divisions he picked up yet another win as he continues to uh rack those off here so again you know that it kind of puts us in a difficult position too it's like kyle bush won a truck race you know what what more can you say about uh what we saw here some guys had some some strong runs and we'll we'll yeah. shout them out here as well but 
Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's not really, I mean, it's a tale as old as time here. Kyle Busch getting in this series and picking up yet another checkered flag. Yeah, I, I will say it was a pretty interesting race for the trucks, which is really surprising uh, d- despite the finish. Um, you know, Corey Heim had a really strong truck as well. And I mean, you look through look through the field there, a lot of heartache we see, and and um, but some strong finishes that uh, don't don't always show up. So uh, it was, you know, the the worn I guess the more worn out surface here in Texas. That really unique style of asphalt. That's that I mean, it almost looks like concrete, but it's not. Um, just the way that it, it ages out out in the, the Lone Star State. But the, the trucks were slipping and sliding, and you could see it from. The Fox cameras, so uh, I was I was pleased with it. Yeah, when again, uh, if you see the second half of the results sheet here, unfortunate deal for Tyler Rankrum again. You know, we've been talking a, a lot on yeah, the yeah. show about the McAnally team uh, and how well they've been doing. Uh, fortunately, got caught up in. Uh, I don't remember if it was an opening lap crash or maybe a, a second lap crash, but still right at the very beginning of the race. Uh, and and Thad Moffat as well. I don't again, you know, but unfortunate deal for that faction forty six program. I know, just uh, trying to get. Uh, started here with that uh, here in 2024 and just has not been the beginning portion of a year that they were hoping for. So hopefully that Moffat can get some things uh, turned around as well as Lane Riggs. You know, he, we, we talked about how this is such a great opportunity for him this year. Um, hate to see him have a uh, 31st place finish. Um, but again, up front, you know, you, you've got your uh, usual contenders as well, like Corey Heim, Nick Sanchez really coming into his own, I think. Uh, Christian Eck is Zane Smith as well. He he had a New York top five, I think, in the cup race. He was running up front there uh, towards the end before he got shuffled back. Um, and then uh, on down there, Daniel Dye, good run for him. The Gray brothers up there. Um, Lawless Allen, again, uh, this is actually a preview to my, one of my one-shotting moments here. Um, great run from that Reum brothers uh, truck as well, narrowly missing out on a top 10. So there are some, there are some, are some strong storylines here, but um, I caught some of Brock's stream as uh, I was getting ready for the wrap-up show yesterday. And, you know, again, I just, the, the age old debate here, you know, or our potential sponsors or uh, Xfinity or cup teams, are they going to look at the results and see, well, he finished second, but uh, it was, it was to a cup guy here. So in, in actuality, he was the best series regular. I think they more look for the first place result on the, on the stat sheet here. And when, when Kyle Busch is in these races, taking those wins away, it's uh, it's a lot harder to get that checked off on your list. That certainly is a viewpoint. Uh <laughs> I mean, yeah, it can be looked at that way, but I, I would, I would hope they would understand who it is that's in P1, and and then look down the line and see who their, who their, who their talent, the best of the rest talent is there. But yeah, um, yeah. I mean, Kyle Busch, he's he's not, he's not looking for a new ride right now. Yeah, well, and again, uh, you know that they can talk about this not really being his own equipment. Of course, Spire purchased Kyle Busch Motorsports last year, so. Technically, it not, is yeah. yeah. If it's not, I mean, <laughs> it's technically not, but at the same time, it's as close as it could be. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of his former equipment that's part of this program here. A lot of, a lot of employees maybe uh, transferring over to that program as well. So it is what it is, you know. And 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 I and I will continue to say this, this is probably the only part of this issue where where Brock and I disagree. I I do give him some credit, you know, not as much as uh, winning a cup race, obviously, but. Again, you know, we, we talked about this uh, in the last segment with the Xfinity cars. You know, we, we, these trucks certainly drive very different than uh, his primary car in the Cup Series with the next-gen car. And to be able to jump into this series and roughly as often as not uh, with his win percentage, be able to just stomp the field like this and, and win a race. You know, I don't want to totally discount the talent that exists in the Truck Series by saying it's a complete non-accomplishment either. Now, of course, not putting it on the level of winning a cup race. I'm not putting his 200 wins on the level of Richard Petty, but you know, there, there are a lot of guys out there that could be taking advantage of this loophole and the rules and taking up their five starts. And Kyle continues to do, it and he continues to be very successful in it. So, uh, you know, not a fan of the rule that allows him to do it, but he's a racer at heart and credit where it's due. Yep. All right. One final open segment before we wrap up the show tonight. Uh, no F2 and F3 for a little while, but we did get some news this week. Andretti Global, of course, trying to continue to fight to get on the F1 grid. They've opened up their facility in Silverstone right down the road from a couple of existing F1 team bases as well. Wouldn't surprise me in the slightest at this point if they just show up on the grid unannounced uh, in 2026 and uh, 
just say, what are you going to do at this point? Kick us out to Formula One because uh, they are still taking this seriously. Michael says our work continues at pace. And they've continued to prove that because they've also announced plans that they would start a Formula 2 and Formula 3 team to go alongside their proposed F1 outfit. So, Brandon, what's your reaction to that news and how does that affect your your thoughts and just how seriously Andretti's taking this quest to continue to fight to get on the grid? Well, I, I didn't need to be convinced anymore that they were serious about taking their place on the grid. and But this would further solidify those already confident uh, beliefs about Michael Andretti and Mario as the, you know, the, the father of it all and Andretti Global and how they're good there. Like you said, they're like it or not, uh, Liberty Media and Formula One, what are you going to do? We're, here we come. 2026. That's that's the the reset day. And that that's cool to hear. They're already in Silverstone and, you know, moving dirt, getting things ready. Um, F2 and F3 programs, those are going to be critical Um I mean, so it, at least if, if you can't, if you get kicked out of the top spot, then maybe you can, um, maybe they'll say, okay, fine for F3 or F2 and, and you can start getting your footing in. But that that is really good news for American Formula One fans. And uh, this might be a very American way of going about it, like it or not. We're, we're coming in and we're going to be a part of this and, and hopefully – stand up to a, a series that does not want uh, USA things <laughs> besides, besides money. Yeah. They're happy to take the money. They're yeah. happy to have uh, three races here, maybe a fourth. They've, they're talking about Chicago now and NASCAR has been successful in their eyes. I'm sure they, they'd still love to get a race in the New York area, which they've tried uh, several times, but yeah, they're, they're happy to take American dollars. Are they happy to take, uh, American teams. I think that's the, the question that's being asked here. And uh, the answer so far has been a resounding no, because every time Michael has met every objective, the goalposts have been moved once again. And uh, re- most recent update we got at the end of January is that they've been flat out denied despite getting approval from the FIA. So if nothing else, maybe uh, you can get these F3 and F2 programs off the ground and uh, running in those series. And, you know, again, I mean, we'll, we'll continue to follow this, uh, situation here. Um, I feel like they kind of left the door open. F1 did for 2028 when they're supposed to come in with Cadillac. But we, I mean, our friend Jackson also put in our group chat this weekend that there are some rumors that the F1 teams, the 10 existing teams with the Concord agreement, they're trying to add a clause to the next Concord agreement that F1 would have a 10 team limit, which uh, I, I would be really? very staunchly opposed to because that, of course, just doesn't shut out Andretti. That would shut out anybody, although. As we've been saying, you know, if Michael Andretti, if the Andretti name, with how seriously they are continuing to prove that they are about this, cannot get on the grid, I don't know how anybody else can. Um, but you would still have a hard limit there of 10 teams when, you know, as recently as 2016, we had 11. As recently as, uh, I guess, 2012, we, we had 12 teams on the grid on uh, 24 cars. They say that that's, you know, the limit that they'd be willing to go to now. Um, and yet we have uh, an eager offered to join the grid with Andretti and uh, they continue to say no. Yeah, that that's just, again, it's just that, that country club type of mentality. We're, we're here first. We don't want you here because we don't like you. It, it just, it has small town vibes too. coming from a small town, a little, little clicks and things like that, that are here and there. It, it feels oddly like that. Um, but on a much, of course, a much, uh, grander level and with a lot more dollars put into it. Yeah. Well, again, you know, I know Gene Haas has been on the record saying he, he doesn't necessarily see the point in staying long-term if he can't find a way for his cars to be a little bit more competitive. So, I mean, if he's selling, I'm sure Michael would be eager to to take up that uh, existing operation and buy that program and Alpine as well. You know, obviously it's been a dreadful start uh, the year for them in uh in formula one and, that was the contingency plan before Cadillac came in that Andretti would be using uh, Renault power units. So maybe there would be an opportunity there for them to buy that entry and kind of become the Renault works team for a couple of years before uh, they bring Cadillac in. But again, you know, 2028 is still a ways away here. Um, You know, it's going to be a crazy enough silly season uh, even before you factor in the possibility that Andretti still uh, continuing their work at pace to try to find a way onto the grid. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how it all plays out. But 
Uh, some welcome news this week that uh, they are, again, quite serious about this with uh, wanting to start an F2 and F3 program alongside uh, their F11 coming in. So uh, we'll continue continue to monitor uh, that situation, I'm sure, as uh, we, we draw closer to those dates. But in the meantime, uh, before we wrap up our show for this evening, Brandon, uh, what's your one shining moment from uh, the Xfinity and Truck races at Texas? Yeah, so for... For mine, I've got a one shining moment for Daniel Dye finishing P6 uh, with McAnally Hildeman Racing. And I, I put him next to the continued frustration for Thad Moffitt for Thad Moffitt uh, finishing 32nd because um, I know they are two different teams, but still they're like the kind of like ghost teammates, in my opinion, because they both share the petty 43, 46 although they're, they're completely two different organizations. It's like they, they allow Daniel Dye to keep the 43 since that's what he's been doing all his career. And then since you've got the, the, the family lineage for the petties for, for Thad Moffat, he gets to keep that, that, that petty look. And I just find that funny how they, they're able to keep that going, even though uh, Daniel Dye had to leave GMS and et cetera, et cetera. But still, the, the highest of highs for Daniel Dye, P6, and the lowest of lows, Thad Moffat, being out early and finishing 32nd, it's not been great at all for Thad Moffat this year. Two DNFs and his highest fin- his highest finish this year, 25th at Las Vegas. Not not a great start, but that's not that's not my one shiny moment though. That goes for uh, Daniel Dye. Well, the obvious one is Ryan Sieg. I mean, how can you not give a call to that organization for continuing to? build up that program and come oh so close to their first win. I got a feeling that uh, at some point they're finally going to break through. It's going to be inevitable if they keep running like this. So a great result for him uh, coming about as close as you possibly can uh, to finally getting that breakthrough victory. But of course, congratulations to Sam Mayer and uh, Ryan Sieg as well on uh, giving the fans quite a treat there at the end with that epic photo finish. Um, like I mentioned, I want to give a shout out to Lawless Allen as well. Just missing out on his top 10. Uh, hasn't been the greatest of a uh, couple of seasons for him either in the truck series, but uh, good to see him have a good run running up in the top 10 there towards the end and just falling uh, just outside of that there at the end in P11. A uh, good result for him and his team. Those are my one shining moments, and that is our show for tonight. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Please follow us on all our social media platforms, X slash Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitch, LinkedIn, Threads, and most importantly, right here on YouTube. Thank you again so much for 1,000 subscribers. Here's to the next thousand. So continue to help us build up our outlet here. If you really like what you saw tonight, you can take a few minutes after the show to invest in our Patreon. Join Colin DeShell, Mark, Robin, David, and Matthew in investing in Grid Network to help keep us on the air throughout 2024 and beyond and help us get to the racetrack a little bit more often. As you can see, our long-term goal of $500 per month will allow us to do just that on a more regular basis, and that expands our coverage for you, the viewers. If you'd rather make a one-time donation instead, you can visit the Buy Me a Coffee link in the description box below. Any amount will help us continue to grow our motorsports media outlet, or like I said at the start of the show, if you're watching on YouTube, we now have Super Chats enabled as well. Now, don't miss Grid tonight on Wednesday with Kobe Lambeth, Josh Birch, and Matt White. Women in Motorsports will be back this week as well with myself, Joe Samiego, and Isha Azim. And of course, you can stay tuned for more Grid Live coverage this coming weekend from the Grid Network pre-race wrap-up. And, of course, we'll see you seven days from now with Encore to follow once again. Brandon, any final thoughts before we sign off for tonight? Oh, what's that? I'm I'm covering my eyes because we're about to go to Sweet Home Alabama next weekend, and it's where uh, you, you, you have to look away and, and anyone has a chance, and uh, hopefully no one turns upside down or it, it's going to be wild. It's always wild. It's the spring race weekend at Talladega. And that's coming our way very shortly. I don't know what I'm going to do for pick a winner this week. I think I'm just going to have to put pick it out of a hat. 30, yeah, 37, hat. 38 names in a hat and just uh, pick one out randomly here. Um, it's going to be very, very interesting, I'm sure. And uh, we'll be right back here next week to recap all of it right here on the Encore Show. And, of course, stay tuned for wrap-up for uh, the Cup Series race and uh, all the other uh, race is going on this weekend. Big weekend across the world for, for motorsports. So we'll have you covered here on Grid Network. For Brandon Crossland, I'm Ben Schneider. Thank you so much for watching. We will see you next week. Have a good one.